I want to thank everybody for coming to our uh, Ocean Currents lecture tonight. I believe this is the seventh in the series, if, if I'm continuing to count properly. For anyone who is new with us tonight, my name is Mark Jolly Van Bodegraven. I am the Director of Environmental Public Education for the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment, where our two speakers this evening um, are, work at the University of Delaware. And tonight's lecture is going to be on uh, what water quality impacts of our wastewater. So for anyone who has joined us previously, you know that this, this year we're doing something a little bit different. We've tried to combine in a lot of our uh, lectures two different speakers with two perspectives on uh, the same topic. It's been very productive so far, sparked some interesting conversations and questions, and we certainly hope that that will be and expect that that will be the case again tonight. Uh, a couple housekeeping matters for everybody before we get started. Uh, the chat is open for the audience to uh, talk with one another, uh, make comments and that sort of thing. But if you do have questions, and we certainly hope you will, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which will allow you to enter questions for either speaker um, as we go. So anytime you, know, you have a question, something occurs to you, go ahead and drop it in that Q&A. I will return after the two presentations to uh, you know, try to get through as many of those questions as, as we can. I'll pose them to our, to our speakers. Um, and if anybody needs anything or has any questions um, for me while things are underway or the more technical nature, I can watch there for those or you can chat as well. So uh, without further ado, as I mentioned, we have two speakers tonight. Um, our, our first, I'll hand over to a minute, but our second speaker will be Dr. Scott Andres from the Delaware Geological Survey. Uh, Dr. Andres, uh, find my notes, <laughs> my apologies. Dr. Andres is a hydrogeologist with the Delaware Geological Survey where he's been since 1984. He has worked, published and presented on a variety of ground and surface water projects and issues. He began his career in hydrogeology with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection where he's responsible for investigating groundwater pollution incidents. Recent research for Dr. Andres relates, related to water resources have focused on the effects of agriculture and land-based disposal of wastewater on soils, rocks, and ground and surface waters, the use of automated sensors for high-frequency monitoring of groundwater and watershed scale water quality, groundwater modeling, submarine groundwater discharge, large-scale mapping and characterization of aquifer hydrology, geometry, and hydraulics. Our he, so he will be our second speaker tonight. Kicking us off this evening, though, with the slide you see uh, already on your screen is Dr. Bill Ullman from the School of Marine Science and Policy. And I will turn it over to Dr. Ullman to introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, we're going to be talking about my favorite, my favorite research topic tonight. So um, I'm very looking forward to getting lots of questions at the end of, of the, our, our presentations today. As long as people have been around, there's been a need for wastewater processing. Uh, the, the consumption of contaminated water can lead to illness and death to both natural and man-made, uh, due to both natural and man-made contaminants. Uh, the first wastewater processing focused on imp improvement of just taste and color and clarity. People filtered water in order for the water to be clear, and they presumed that it, if it was clear, it was clean. That wasn't always the case. Um, the, is the first real treatment started of, of water to make the water that was not look clear and healthy was uh, came about about 3,500 years ago when the first uh, filtering was used to clear, clarify water that was using usually sand as the filtration medium, sometimes cloth uh, or fibers of some type for doing that. But that's, this has been around for 3,500 years. So wastewater processing is one of the oldest engineering uh, 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 activities of the, hum of the human race. So uh, as communities grew, so did the need for potable water. About 300 years ago, engineers built the first ready-made filtration plants for clarifying water. This was done in Scotland, uh, where to, to remove the what appeared to be contaminants, which were suspended particles, and 
presumably removing some real contaminants that they couldn't identify at that time. So as, as human communities grew, there were more and more need for clean and healthy drinking water. And this is still a problem today in many places in the world. There are places where getting drinkable water, uh, which is safe to drink, is uh, limited. And that limits the economies of many countries, particularly in arid regions. So in the last 30 years at the University of Delaware, uh, I, my research has focused on coastal ecosystems and on fresh water and, and saltwater quality. In particular, I've been interested in how water flows through natural terrestrial, estuarine, marine, and hypersaline ecosystems. Uh, and the reaction, the chemical reactions that take place that modify the composition of waters over time. Uh, researchers who are interested in water quality have to be pay attention both to natural, natural uh, uh, chemical reactions or biogeochemical reactions that are occurring and also man-made reactions to do that, uh, to understand the, um, uh, the, the, the origin and the quality of the water that they're working on. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you about marshes and estuaries in the coastal zone and particularly focusing on activity in, in Delaware that I should, uh, that, uh, uh, see I'm highlighting on, on the picture. I hope that that's visible to all of you. Um, so Delaware has lots of estuarine, estuaries, marshes, an extensive coastal zone. Uh, and to uh, we're gonna talk about the way that this environment serves to treat water naturally and how we do it also mechanically in order to get clean drinking water for our human use. So the system is, the, the system is fairly complicated uh, in terms of just the, the physics and the chemistry, what the sources are. I like to think of uh, the, that there are in our estuary, estuaries and our watersheds, they, these are coupled together by flows where net discharges goes downstream, but there also are tidal discharges, which means even salt waters move upstream into fresher waters. We have, so we have a two-way two transport of water, meaning that uh, among other things, that the residence time of the time that water stays in the estuary is longer because it can go back and slosh back and forth a couple of times in the estuary before it finally discharges to the open ocean. So um, I, I, there's, there are interesting things about this, this process of, of how watersheds and estuaries interact that affect the pH of water, the acidity of the water, also affects the amount of nutrients that are coming from the watershed down into the estuary where it uh, contributes to uh, plant growth in, in the lower parts of the estuary. There's, it's a very complex system, but a very interesting system and it has impact on very large fractions of the whole global uh, uh, population. So wastewater treatment systems are really just engineered and managed analogs to natural watersheds, rivers, marshes, and estuaries. The same kinds of chemical reactions happen in wastewater treatment plants as happen in our estuaries to a large extent. In order to get make that water that's in these systems, uh, that these natural waters drinkable, however, there's a number of things that have to happen to make, to, to make water safe to drink. First and foremost is nobody particularly likes to drink water that looks uh, dirty, say turbid is the te technical word. So uh, race, wastewater or, or water for drinking has to, well, wastewater or any other source of water that might ultimately be used for drinking requires the removal of particles. And there are lots of techniques for doing this, settling to the seafloor, uh, is is what happens in in the in the natural environment, in uh, uh, in a wastewater treatment plant. There are other ways of getting 
getting particles to aggregate and settle out naturally in slow moving waters to remove particles from drinking water. So the processes are similar. Uh, the how they are controlled is a little bit different and, and from place to place, but basically the uh, the same kinds of reactions are taking place in a wastewater treatment plant that take place in uh, nature. Just different intensities, but the same kind of thing. So primary treatment is is the is the first thing that, that happens to water in a wastewater treatment plant. And mostly this regard is related to removing of particles. The settling of the particles to the seafloor is kind of what happens in the marshes. In wastewater treatment plants, the settling of particles into the whatever type of reactor is being used by the wastewater treatment people, uh, it settles out to the bottom. And it's, it's at some point it's removed from the bottom of some big tank and, and used for other purposes. Uh, so primary treatment is the removal of particles. Secondary treatment is the reactive of react, removal of reactive organic matter. This is sometimes referred to the reactive organic matter is referred, referred to as biological oxygen demand, but it's, it's basically removes, it, it removes the most easily removable uh, uh, parts of the, of the wastewater that are chemically removed and you are left with material that is less reactive and more recalcitrant in the, in the effluent. So primary treatment removes particles, secondary tre treatment removes reactive organic matter. Subsequently, there's a tertiary treatment process, which is the removal of particulate organic matter, but also removes some nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen and phosphorus are nutrients, which tend to support biological activity and in excess can make waters that are, are relatively clear, uh, very turbid just by the, the presence of uh, organic matter and, and uh, uh, living, living organisms, living microscopic plants and animals, for example. And the last type of treatment is some, referred to as advanced, sometimes referred to as quaternary. And this is treatment for polishing of the water to make even wastewater can be treated enough so that that wastewater can be recycled and reused sometimes even for drinking, it's clean enough after it's been done. And that's referred to as quaternary or advanced treatment. And the, the water that comes out of that uh, uh, quaternary uh, wastewater treatment plant is essentially drinkable, although it's not often made available directly for drinking except in places where uh, the amount of water available is so small that they have to reuse their water. And this is sometimes returned called polishing. And when you polish water is essentially drinkable water that's coming out of a wastewater treatment plant. And that is possible and it, that is done in many parts of the world where water is limited it's to some extent. So the major research question that I've addressed over the last 30 years is how we can better manage water and nutrient fluxes to maintain watershed and estuarine water quality and the biological productivity of coastal uh, waters, particularly in the Murderkill Estuary. This is in central uh, Delaware uh, and similar ecosystems on the Atlantic coast. So some ideas, we, we can increase, there are lots of things that can be done to manage the water quality. And we have to understand how the water reacts with the sediment around it, how it's affected by the, the organisms, both animals and plants that exist around them. And we can increase water, for example, increase water residence time in the watersheds to give more time for particle removal. And that makes water that looks turbid, more clear and more likely to be useful for other purposes. Uh, uh, we can, uh, we, one of the things we can do is actually build essentially retention ponds in the watershed so that water flows less rapidly from the upper watershed to the lower waters, watershed and maintains water that can be used for agricultural purposes and perhaps other purposes. Uh, 
in the watershed rather than letting it run out to the, to the ocean where it becomes saline and is less useful for human uh, consumption. Um, and we can actively manage freshwater and saltwater ponds to, to, to control discharge. Uh, and this is done in places where there's shortages of water. Uh, the example is often is talked about is in the Netherlands where they are, in order they manage their freshwater and saltwater ponds to uh, decrease the uh, movement of saltier water that might contaminate their drinking water supplies. Um, so other ways of doing this is to actually take water from uh, lower part, fresh water from lower parts of, of watershed and pumping them back up into the upper watershed. Anything that involves pumping of water gets to be more expensive and more difficult to maintain. Uh, and as much as possible, you would like to have, uh, take advantage of the gravity flow from the uplands to the estuary and to the ocean as a way of moving water around without pumping. But in places where water is limited or the water quality is not good enough, pumping is a very common way of, of moving water around in order to allow to it, the chemistry to be better for drinking. So in the last 30 years or so, I've been working on basically Delaware um, estuaries. I actually looked up, the, I took my first wastewater treatment course in 1972, which is a long time ago, where the focus at that time was primarily on industrial contaminants in water. And subsequently, when I went to graduate school, I started working on, on more natural processes in, in estuaries and uh, of uh, estuaries and, and other ecosystems. And I, I have to say that in Delaware over the years, I've had support primarily from the Kent County uh, Levy Court and some other sources that have allowed us, to, allowed me and my colleague, Scott Andrus, who's gonna speak shortly, to conduct research on water uh, movement in the, in the estuarine systems and in the watersheds and uh, I will, uh, I, I have to say that we, we appreciate all of that uh, support that we've had from the various agencies that I mentioned down in, in this slide. And some of this work is continuing and will continue even after I'm fully retired, I hope. So uh, with that, I, I will pass this on to Scott Andrus, who will talk a little bit more about uh, what the politics and the policies associated with water and wastewater treatment. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Uh, by training and by nature, I am more of a scientist than my presentation topic today. My presentation topic today is more on how we do the things we do and why we do them on wastewater and stormwater in the state of Delaware. So more of a, a look at our governmental and societal systems for managing these two things in our state. Uh, when people ask me about wastewater and stormwater in Delaware, I use the word disposal. Delaware is a one and done state. We don't typically recycle our water in any kind of significant way. There are some minor efforts that have gone into recycling wastewater, but uh, by and large, more than 99% of what we do with wastewater and stormwater is uh, get rid of it. Uh, we don't look at it as a resource like they do in the arid west of, of this country, or even in Florida where they have plenty of water, but they have to be really careful what they do with it. So here I'm showing you a cartoon of the hydrologic cycle. This is where I would start off because this is the environment we work in. And so we're looking at a picture of the landscape with trees on top and we have groundwater underneath, water underground and a series of aquifers or water bearing units and confining beds, which tend not to uh, yield water to wells. And in Delaware's world, uh, the water table aquifer, we call the Columbia Aquifer, is a very prolific source of water for a large number of domestic wells. It used to be a prolific source of water for a large number of public water wells uh, too, but we generally spoiled that water uh, to the point where it's not the first choice for public water systems. Uh, it's everything people do on land surfaces tend to get into the groundwater and then move for one to 10 years 
tens of years in the water table or Columbia Aquifer. When you get deeper into the combined aquifers, you're talking thousands to hundreds of years from when it gets into the ground and to where it pops out in the stream. Um, in terms of the hydrologic cycle, we get roughly 44 to 45 inches of rainfall a year on the average. Uh, of that, the, the vast majority, more than two thirds of it evaporates back or is transpired by plants. Evapotranspiration is the technical term. Abbreviated ET, right? So that goes back to the atmosphere. That's 28 to 32 inches on the average in most, in most of the state of Delaware. Uh, trees transpire more water than agricultural fields. Uh, agricultural fields transpire more water than a subdivision or a paved parking lot. So uh, when you look at the landscape and you wanna think about where's all the water going, uh, in the forest, most of it's evaporating. In a subdivision, most of it's running off and then going directly into a stream uh, or into a stormwater retention pond where it's, the discharge is slow to go to the stream. Uh, but in general, 45 inches down into the ground, 28 to 32 goes back up into the air on the average. Um, the runoff overland is usually very small, just two to six inches per year. And the remainder infiltrates into the groundwater system. So that's on the average 12 to 16 inches per year. Uh, that for every square mile, if you like the numbers, half a million gallons of water per day per square mile is flowing through the ground and popping out in a stream somewhere. If you go out into the landscape of Delaware and look at a stream this time of year, and it's still flowing, you're looking at a groundwater discharge. Uh, they, groundwater discharge maintains stream flow during fair weather. So what does uh, wastewater and stormwater disposal do? Well, it collects water from a, a relatively large area. If you think of uh, wa wastewater, it could be a sewer system that covers many square miles. And then it takes it all to one place where they treat it and then eventually release it back into the wild. It could go directly into a stream and there's still a few of those left in the state of Delaware. Uh, but for the most part, most of it goes, is put through engineered systems and encouraged to infiltrate back into the ground. But it disrupts the natural system. Uh, so just some, rule, some uh, numbers for you. For a typical domestic wastewater system, you're, you're gonna be putting down four to five times more water into your domestic wastewater system than would normally fall on your property. So you've, you've increased the flow four to five times. Um, if you go to the next le level up of a small uh, wastewater system or a moderately sized wastewater system like the count Sussex County runs with spray irrigation, you're talking it concentrates it 10 times the amount that normally would fall as rainfall. If you go to the next level of sophistication for engineering, like a rapid infiltration basin, you're in the low hundreds of times. Uh, so what you're, you're, you're pushing a lot of water through the ground and making it move a lot faster. And where that becomes important in our state is if there's any contaminants left in that water, they move with the water. They don't stay behind. There's no magic sand. Uh, our aquifers are very poorly suited to removing contaminants. And so you'll see up stories in the paper about synthetic organic chemicals like polyfluoral, polyfluorinated alkyl substances, really scary sound of things, and they are scary. But even in wastewater world, nitrogen and phosphorus are part of the wastewater we get rid of, and it finds its way through the ground where it eventually pops out in the stream in a, in a few years to a few decades. Um, so the, where does this become important is how it intersects with economy and how we manage our resources and our society, societal needs. Um, Delaware has gone to the, the idea that uh, we wanna put our wastewater and stormwater into the ground because if we put it directly into the stream, there's an immediate problem that people will see and complain about. It will kill fish immediately. Uh, so we'll stick it in the ground and where it will be out of sight for a few years to a few tens of years before it pops up again. So uh, one of the downsides of that is groundwater flows very, you know, it'll take decades to flush through there. So how does Delaware deal with wastewater and stormwater or WW and SW? There's a whole bunch of pieces of it. You have to collect it. You have to convey it or transport it. You have to treat it or not, and then dispose it. 
And they're all separate activities regulated by overlapping federal, state, local, and interstate initiatives. It makes for a very complicated system. At the federal level, we have the Federal Clean Water Act, been around since 1972 and was released on Earth Day in 1972. It was one of the events that led me to become an environmental science type of person. And underneath the Federal Clean Water Act is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NIFTES. And that covers discharges to surface water, but not to groundwater. And this operates as a permit to pollute concept. And it's administered within Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, or my favorite acronym, DENREC, through the Division of Water, the Surface Water Discharges section. And there, underneath of that, DENREC has a whole bunch of state laws, regulation, and funding that takes and customizes the federal approach to Delaware conditions. It's not just our natural conditions in the ground and streams and estuaries, but also our political climate. And so we have exceptional waters of, and Aries waters, exceptional resource waters. We have the total maximum daily load or TMDL. We have stormwater regulations. Uh, Delaware manages the NIPTES program. Uh, Delaware also manages on-site or land-based wastewater treatment system. And the big daddy of all holding the purse strings for all this is the Water Infrastructure Advisory Council. They dole out tens of millions of dollars a year for all types of things water related. So beyond that, so we're gonna go right into the state side, the state law and regulations regulate and permit all discharges to land, that's septic systems, spray irrigation, rapid infiltration basins, and then the sludge that comes out of a wastewater plant, the solids that are pulled out and, and removed, uh, go are regulated by the state, not the federals. But then overlapping that, you have the Chesapeake Bay program or the Delaware Bay, Delaware Estuary program that handle the waterways that encompass multiple states. So even though Delaware would like to do things all on their own, when a watershed in Delaware drains to the Delaware Bay or to the Chesapeake Bay, they have to play by those rules too. And then uh, one of the things that goes along with this, most uh, state funding is always insufficient. Federal funding by and large pays the largest portion of money uh, into the system to pay for wastewater treatment plants, pump stations, uh, conveyance systems for pipes and so forth. Uh, recently, there was a big victory for environmental groups in Delaware when they passed the Clean Water for Delaware Act this past legislative session, put up a, a few, uh, I don't know if it was tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars that will be used to match federal dollars to bring more money into the state to fix our wastewater and stormwater systems. If this doesn't make your head swim, then you're a much smarter person than me because these are complex projects and the permitting and jargon are the rule. And one thing that's common, everybody argues and the arguments are incessant and never stop. They're always arguing about who, whose rules they have to follow, whose money they're gonna spend, and how much money is gonna be spent. So that's not just Delaware, that's nationwide pretty much, but Delaware has its own flavor for that. Uh, Delaware has promoted discharges to groundwater. And there's a couple really good economic reasons for that. There's a couple less good technical reasons for it. But discharge to groundwater has become the preferred disposal method in Southern Delaware. It's been that way for 25 years or longer, most of my career. But the authority is split amongst multiple DNREC offices. You have the Division of Water, the Groundwater Discharges section writes the permits for discharges to groundwater. Uh, the Division of Water, Water Supply section provides technical support on hydrogeology and contamination incidents. Uh, on the stormwater side, the Division of Watershed Stewardship through the Sediment and Stormwater Management Program managed the federal MS4 process of the Clean Water Act. This is what manages stormwater permits and permitting, all those retention basins in the state of Delaware. Um, but the unfortunate part here is the pro programmatic link to groundwater issues is not clearly defined within DENREC. And the control of groundwater impacts by stormwater are secondary to surface water impacts. Uh, the mantra I, I've heard multiple times is infiltrate now, we'll clean it up later. 
Uh, that's a very short-sighted type of view. It's what brought us some of the worst landfills in the, in the United States that we are still cleaning up 50 years later. Um, all of these things, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System and federal regulation is absent. It's all up to the states and what the state wants to do. And this is getting more interesting by the day. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, I mentioned that the, con the control systems the state has definitely are heavily weighted towards economic concerns. Um, jobs, jobs, jobs tends to drown out anything, any concerns raised by environmental groups or even private citizens that are concerned about what's happening in, the, in their neighborhood and in their waters. Um, the sad reality is because we're here, we make wastewater and it won't ever stop. Uh, we have to deal with it in a way. Uh, the disposal of this, I call it tragedy of the commons and private concerns exter externalize their costs and drive, and they also drive the regulatory process, all the money, and also the political control systems that take care of that. Um, the, all, so, and the funding and control systems regulations have trended towards replacing surface water discharges with groundwater discharges. Right in the Inland Bays watershed, close to where you, if you're in Sussex County, you might be in it. Uh, they've removed all of the point sources of dis, uh, pipes that di discharged treated wastewater into the inland bays. Now, either it goes into the ground or it goes offshore into the ocean. Uh, that was a, a, a rather uh, long view of how to do things. It's a safety valve that people are going to be glad that you have in the future. The reason they did this treatment to, uh, to treat for discharge to the ground is that they wrote the permits so, and regulations so that the requirements are less stringent and the costs are much lower than they are for surface water. Uh, so yeah, if it's gonna cost me $3 per thousand cubic feet to treat wastewater in for a point source, but it only costs me a dollar to go to groundwater, you can guess where the money, where it's gonna go. It's gonna go into the groundwater. Uh, the downside of that is it's gonna come out again in a, few, in a decade or less. The reason I say it's, it's going to be interesting, there was a recent Supreme Court of the United States decision about this very practice of transferring your waste from surface water discharges to the groundwater. Um, they, the, this decision was in regards to a specific case, but with a bunch of others attached to it, Maui County versus the Hawaii Wildlife Fund. And this decision came down in 2019. Maui was injecting their treated wastewater into the ground a few, a few thousand feet away from a nearby swimming beach. That nearby swimming beach eventually had unreasonable levels of uh, pathogenic bacteria as well as uh, cyanobacteria blooms and other phytoplankton problems that showed up. And so that forced the Wildlife, Federa Wildlife Fund to sue the, the state and wound up in the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, hey, Hawaii, you made a mistake here. You can't just say because you put it in the ground it no longer needs a, a uh, surface water permit because it's coming out in the surface water. You have to go back and look at this again. Well, the, the, the state and the county went back and looked at it again, decided that they weren't gonna do anything different. And then recently, this earlier this year, there was another Supreme Court ruling that said, uh-uh, you can't just wag your finger and make this go away. You have to get a permit. You have, Hawaii has to create a separate, separate permitting process for uh, discharges to ground where the water may eventually wind up in surface water. And that's what they call the functional equivalence of direct discharge. Uh, they also directed the US EPA to come up with guidance and means and funding to deal with this issue across the country. So, and you know, this decision at the Supreme Court level undoes a problem that began in 1972 with the original Clean Water Act, where they separated surface water and groundwater. And it, and it creates a lot of problems for every state in the country where they have tried to come up with their own rules to deal with their own natural environment and political process to allow development to happen in an orderly way, have wastewater treatment that doesn't bankrupt everybody, and so forth. 
Um, so when I leave this here, I expect a court challenge in Delaware on this very issue within, within my lifetime. So within the next 20 to 30 years, I would expect surf riders or uh, the Inland Bays Foundation or maybe national, uh, the, the Wildlife Federation to sue the state of Delaware and the EPA to deal with some of the more egregious places where uh, land-based wastewater disposal happens within a, uh, a baseball throw of a stream and, and it's pretty obvious what's going on. So with that, I was gonna open it up uh, for questions to the audience for Bill and myself. Thank you, Dr. Andrus. Uh, appreciate you uh, uh, bringing us to this point and that very useful presentation. Uh, try to make it so that everybody can see everyone again. Um, so yeah, just a reminder to our audience here, you can uh, submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll be uh, posing them here uh, to Dr. Ullman, Dr. Andrus, to the best of my ability to figure out which questions are for which speaker. But if you have somebody specific in mind, please let me know that too in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Andrus, just because we just heard the end of your presentation, I wanted to ask, um, thank you for, thank you both for your presentations. I was a little bit um, surprised I shouldn't be hearing you speak, Dr. Andrus, about the problems of using uh, discharge to groundwater because I think I had uh, heard that this was preferred method because it's, uh, you know, it, it addresses flooding if you have, you know, if you're infiltrating instead of, instead of discharging to surface, it is supposed to use some of the advantages of natural filtration, but it, it sounds like from your presentation, those benefits are maybe not, uh, not the whole story. There's more yeah, the I would agree. The benefits are not the whole story. And for stormwater, especially, right, you want to slow the flow of stormwater into the aquatic environment so it doesn't scour out stream beds and, and displace the biota that are there. Um, and that's generally good. Uh, but, you know, in, ter and in terms of pollutant removal, it's a, um, it removes sediment. So you're not loading up a stream with sediment because you're letting the water settle before it gets there. But most of the dissolved pollutants, they readily move with the groundwater and will eventually make it into the surface water. So now you look at how they engineer these systems, uh, a stormwater retention pond 50 feet away from a stream is there just to slow the water out down. There's no treatment offered. Uh, there's no replenishment of groundwater resources in, involved there. If you did your stormwater far away from a stream, it will get into the aquifer where it could potentially be reused. But Delaware tends to be one and done, right? Uh, there is no engineered system to recapture and reuse that stormwater. And that's a very common practice in the arid west and in Florida and uh, Texas, right? So, and more humid parts of Texas, right? They want to reuse every drop of water as many times as they can. They want to be smart engineering to capture the pollutants that are associated with stormwater or wastewater. Uh, Delaware doesn't have the pocketbook to do that at this point. Uh, that also caught my ear that you said Florida has plenty of water. You know, you could argue Delaware has plenty of water with that rainfall totals, but they have to be careful with it. I wanted to ask you to expound on that a little bit. You know, why would you still want to reuse water when there's not a concern about supply? Um, I think, you know, in Delaware, we have we don't have the population base or the agricultural sector pressure that they have in Florida. We don't grow sugar cane, right? And we don't supply uh, food to millions and millions of people, except maybe by chickens. Uh, but our use of water uh, by and large has not been large compared to our, the amount of water that comes into the state. Uh, so there's also some societal uh, perceptions that Wastewater is dirty and we can't use it and we don't want to be near it. And so in Florida, where they reuse wastewater for agriculture and horticulture, we don't do that very much in Delaware because of the perception issue. Uh, some people call it the ick factor, right? We, Delaware still hung up on that. Texas, they already reuse their wastewater for drinking water, right? They use it on the space station. I mean, there's play, it's all over the world we do it. Delaware doesn't. Uh, if I could be as bold to make a prediction, within 10 years, Delaware is going to have to do it uh, because of the pressure of growing population and growing use of 
growing irrigation demands on the water resources, especially in Sussex County. So it's maybe on the way. It's on the way. And I, oh, think, okay. you know, I think that some of the people that are in the engineering side are ready for it. They're just waiting for the political will to, to push the money into it to make it happen. Mark, can I, can I add something to this? Please do. So before I came to the University of Delaware, I was a researcher at, at Australian National University. Uh, Australia is a continent which is very, very dry. Um, most of the groundwater is not suitable for drinking at all because it's too salty. And so the issues of, of uh, water quality and, and uh, are so enormous there that there are really very limited places in Australia where you can grow crops. And that is, and with recent history of being warmer and having more evaporation uh, because of the temperatures, it's getting to be a bigger and bigger problem in Australia. And it's getting to be a similarly big problem all over the world just because of evaporation. It's not even, it's not even a question of contamination but it's another issue of overall water availability that's affecting uh, large portions of the, uh, the livable world. And we're, we're, we are not preparing for that. I appreciate you bringing that perspective. And one of the things we've also wanted to do as we've taken these um, lectures and conversations online is look beyond Delmarva and, and think about you know, the larger world. We, we have people join us from, um, you know, mostly here regionally, but you, you can watch these presentations from anywhere. We do want to think about how it works in other places. Um, Dr. Ullman, I wanted to ask you to actually um, follow up on something you had mentioned in your presentation, and then we'll, we'll get to some of the Q&As, but please keep submitting those. Um, you had talked about some, some possible techniques, uh, you know, that can be used within a watershed that helps manage um, wastewater and, and uh, you know, make it available for use. You talked about um, pumping saltwater ponds, freshwater impoundments. Are there examples of those kinds of management systems in Delaware, and, and do they work well? You know, are we encouraging uh, the replenishment of freshwater into aquifers and things through any of those methods that you know of here or locally? I think uh, Scott's going to be more expert on this, but I will start by saying that that uh, in Delaware, as far as I know, there are not attempts to slow down the movement of water from the freshwater table up on the uplands to the ocean, uh, to the estuaries into the ocean. Uh, it is done in other places, um, so, but it's not, I do not think it's done in uh, Delaware and Scott's the expert on this, so he's probably the person to answer that. Uh, I do know places in Australia where they intentionally have, where they have fresh water, they constantly are pumping uh, water that has been used for one purpose back higher in the watershed to get some percolation back to the area that they need uh, fresh water. And the problem with that is over time, whatever they do, they still, it gets saltier and saltier and it gets harder and harder to reuse that water. Scott? Yeah, so uh, in Delaware, our natural environment is such that if we tried to slow the flow of groundwater down, we would flood ourselves out. Uh, the water table is very shallow in many parts of Delaware. I mean, in the eastern part of the state, uh, less than five feet to groundwater on the average. Right? On a wet year, we flood, at, we flood from below many places. That's one of the factors that's going to be happening with sea level rise on Delmarva as well as most of the East Coast of the US, um, a rise of one foot of, the, of sea level uh, will translate to one foot or more of rise in the water table for considerable distances from the beach. Uh, and so if you're, you know, if you're in a place where the water table was three feet on the average, it's gonna be less than two on the average. And then after some serious storms or some wet periods of wet weather, you're going to be splashing in puddles. Uh, we already see that occasionally. And so what we would expect is that the frequency and duration of those events will, will gradually increase. So more uh, evidence that these are all uh, local. You, you need to consider the local conditions for any local of these conditions. systems and needs. Yeah, so um, think, think of, I had one more thing to add to that. Think about the Netherlands and the low countries of Northern Europe. 
they pump their groundwater out to get it out of the way so that they can actually use the land. Uh, when, when, you know, they did it with windmills. Originally, now they have some incredibly sophisticated engineering marvels to keep the water out and to allow commerce to continue. Uh, you know, we're not far, you know, we're three feet or four feet of sea level rise away from that over large areas of Delaware. I just saw uh, come into the Q&A, somebody's making a comment that they can testify to the high water table said uh, Morris Library has had water infiltration. So that's interesting to see. Um, Want to let everyone know or remind everyone, you do have the, the chat option if you just kind of want to share something with the audience, but I figured I'd pass that one along. Um, I am going to get to some of these questions over here now from the, from the audience. Um, Sharon had uh, mentioned uh, something she's heard that she's curious about, wanted to know whether either of you know about, and it, it speaks to something that I think Dr. Andrews started to talk about in, in Hawaii in that Maui case. She says that she's heard reports of, of fecal matter or contamination in New Jersey beaches, um, but it makes me think of uh, what you were talking about where the groundwater can then show up in surface water and cause blooms or you know perhaps dangerous conditions. Do we know, are things like that happening around here, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, you know, are, are these things we see happening, whether they're the beaches or, or elsewhere in the state? Bill, you wanna go first on that one? I'll let you, I'll let you go because you probably know the local, local situation better. Right, so uh, we have, there are issues in New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland with fecal matter, but it's usually related to wildlife mm -hmm. or, or pets, right? That's a, it's a problem in Rehoboth Dewey um, where they have a resident geese and duck population that lives around a few of those ponds up there. And they have some serious problems after storms with that washing that material into the, into the pond and then or into the stormwater system and out onto the, the coastal water right near the beach. The state has a really uh, sophisticated testing program where they test regularly. And there are occasional beach clothing, closings in Delaware and Maryland, New Jersey because of these kinds of issues. The days of uh, human waste on the beach are long, they're decades ago. Those, that problem was solved long, pretty much long ago, unless there's a catastrophe where the collapse of a sewer main or you know, something really serious happens with that kind of engineered system failing. Uh, the engineered systems are in place to keep that from happening, uh, but it, it's still something to, to wonder about because I don't, I don't care if it's human or goose. I mean, you don't want to swim in it. You don't want to have to ingest that. Thank you. Um, we have a, a couple of people asking questions uh, related, you know, in, in kind of a, a theme here. People are interested in knowing how they can get involved. So I might ask you a couple of these in succession. Um, Trey was wondering whether it would make sense for the members of the public, like those with us tonight, to contact NREC regarding discharge to groundwater issues. You know, is, is that where they can get involved or how would people express their interest in this um, topic? Does it make sense to go to the regulators, to somebody else? Um, there's, there's multiple avenues that people can get involved with this. The first one is education, right? Uh, thank you for coming tonight. You, you, step, you took the first step towards becoming a little more educated in how things work in this state. Um, but beyond that, the next, the next level is you have to figure out how the state really works, which is not a small task, right? How, how are permits issued? How do you comment on a permit application? The public always has an opportunity to make their concerns heard in that process. Um, the next level is a, little, is a lot more disruptive, right? We have environmental advocacy groups um, that you can join or not, NGOs. So I see one there, Delaware Center for the Inland Base, a great advocacy group that you can become part of. Uh, there are other advocacy groups active in the state of Delaware where you can join your voices with others. They have some funding available to to do the lobbying activities and they have a seat at the table at many of these regulatory types of meetings where decisions are made. Um, and that it has a, some influence. I, I have a very jaded view of this that uh, the moneyed interests usually win out in all these cases. Uh, so then they, you need the more disruptive kind of thing uh, where you know, surf riders chain themselves to a truck somewhere or there's a, there's a noisy protest in front of legislative hall uh, about a particular 
one particular uh, permit application, there have been a few of them, or about a particular pollution event like uh, that happened near Millsboro with the poultry plant there. Uh, there were some really noisy protests associated with that. And it wound up, you know, there was a major court decision in favor of the people that were wronged by that, that problem. Uh, so you, you just got to be aware. Uh, I'm not quite sure how you become aware. You could use the internet. You could use the public uh, advertisement section of the newspaper in the classifieds where permits are advertised. And then you have to figure out where you put your oar in the water to make noise. Can I add something, Scott? Go right ahead. So my, my, my answer to this question is that people who live in Delaware need to start asking questions about the water quality that is under their, uh, under their property and the water quality in, of, of the groundwater that's being pumped, primarily groundwater, that's being pumped to their houses and whether there's treatment being done to that and how good the quality of the treatment is. I think we, this, is, this is an invisible problem. And because it is invisible, very rarely does somebody pop up and say, well, tell me a little bit more about groundwater contamination within 100 yards of my house. Or uh, what, how do I know that the well water I'm getting, I'm, I'm drinking is of good quality? How can I have that checked? Now, the state does check some, uh, will help you check the quality of your local groundwater, but only if you ask to do, for them to do that. So I recommend people, when you buy a new house, you're moving into a new area, or even regularly over time, you should be checking your, your uh, drinking water and perhaps the groundwater un underneath your property before you uh, invest money, more money in your homes and in, uh, uh, in Delaware. It's interesting. I did, didn't realize that you could kind of get that assistance if you know how to how to ask for it. And it kind of tees up another question, uh, Dr. Ullman. Actually, I'm not sure whether either of you um, have, have worked with this in the past, but Barb uh, is asking, how can citizen scientist volunteers get involved to help? Is there is there a data collection effort here that people who are interested and, and have some knowledge could help with um, where we would learn more, like you're saying, about how what the water is like in different places around the state? I am not, I don't know anybody, any group that is doing regular water testing or high, regular high quality water testing uh, locally in Southern Delaware. Um, I do know that occasionally there, there are people sampling uh, drinking water in housing developments and things like that. So I think there's some level of, of routine uh, of uh, sampling and analysis, but I just don't know how extensive it is. And most of the people I know who have, have had their water tested have done so when they buy a new property as a, that they have it, uh, the water tested of that property. And that's mostly in rural areas where there's not centralized water uh, treatment and water uh, uh, management. I can uh, chime in on a uh, surface water effort um, with my other hat on for Delaware Sea Grant, the um, citizen water quality monitoring effort is volunteer run Sea Grant's uh, Marine Advisory Service. Dr. Ed Warat runs that. Um, so there, there are opportunities to get involved with water quality monitoring as a volunteer, but it, it, it wouldn't be the groundwater questions and things of that sort they're looking for. I mean, but to Dr. Anderson's point, um, there's some crossover here, right? Nutrients and pollutants that go into the groundwater end up in the surface water. Um, we have a question from Nancy uh, here. How involved and effective are religious-based organizations and Delaware nonprofit environmental organizations in promoting clean water initiatives? Um, it seems like it might relate a little bit to the, the clean water for Delaware um, uh, legislation that was just passed. I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit more about how that came about or generally how these organizations do, like Center for the Inland Bates. Yeah, they, uh, that clean water for Delaware initiative took a lot of effort by many organizations and private citizens to, to make it over the finish line. It was two or three legislative sessions where that didn't make it, and this year it finally did. Uh, and so groups like the one near and dear to my heart, the Center for the Inland Bays, Bill and I have both served, served on that uh, group's board of directors. 
but there were many others that participated and um, I am not knowledgeable about all the groups, but I would not be surprised if there were any faith based groups in there that promoted clean water because it seems like the concept of promoting clean water for everybody is is one of those things that would be consistent with many of the faith based groups. Um, but that's that's one. Uh, one of the things in my career, I answered a lot of phone calls and emails from people with these kinds of questions. Um, the uh, NGOs asked frequently. I have not really received any calls from the faith-based groups or from churches, church groups about water quality issues. Dr. Ullman, do you have anything to add? Other organizations or uh, other? No, I, 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 Scott and I have the bias towards the Center for the Inland Bays because, as I said, we've both been officers of that uh, of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee at various times. So, but um, I think I don't think there's a very organized effort. But it's it the state does provide some level of water uh, quality uh, analysis if people bring them samples. So there there are possibilities of of setting these kinds of things up of things up for local developments and for local communities and for individuals, I think, through the state of Delaware. Scott may know a little bit more about how that system works. Yeah, that's uh, it's run through the Division of Public Health. Any one of the state service, well, not any one of them, uh, several of the larger state service centers, there's one in Georgetown, definitely one in Kent, one in Newcastle, and probably other satellite offices where an individual can go buy a test kit for $5. And and receive a, ba a very basic water quality test and some information about your water. Um, if you have public water, there are, the public water is tested regularly and uh, your water provider is supposed to send you a newsletter every year. Uh, plus there are all types of internet resources about your water providers, uh, the quality of the water they serve to you, any violations they've had over the years and how they were resolved. Uh, from a public health standpoint, the really awful things that used to happen don't happen anymore because of that. Uh, but there still is a chance, right? You got to pay attention. Uh, if you, yeah, you always hear, if you see something, say something. Uh, I usually tell people about their water. If you smell something, say something. Uh, it, it shouldn't smell. It shouldn't taste funny. Uh, so you want to ask your water provider or go buy, go buy the test kit. And work and work through that avenue. Yeah, we do have a, a question here. Um, someone is wondering whether the annual reporting that is published by providers is is trustworthy. You know, do you need to? Can you read that report and get the information you need, or do you need to be more uh, critical? Um, they've they've named where they are and their water provider. <laughs> I'm going to turn it into a general question. Uh, yeah, those those. Uh... Consumer reports that are put out for the for the uh, customers of those public water systems, they're reviewed at the state level um, by professionals, right? So there's nothing egregiously wrong with them. Um, I've looked at the reports. Uh, you don't necessarily get all the information of every test and every result that they got, but they'll tell you what, what didn't work, you know, what's not right and what's being done to make it right. So from that perspective, most public water systems, I feel fairly confident they're doing a good job in providing a good product to their customers. But things, you know, things do get upset from time to time. Yeah, Scott, the other thing that, I, that I've heard, and this is mostly local in Southern Delaware, is that you, you, there, there are just not enough tests being done to get a sense of whether there's a regional contamination problem or only local contamination problems because they rely on the homeowners to uh, collect the water sample and to pay for getting the analysis done. And that means that it's not done often enough and over a wide enough area. I don't, you might have more uh, sense of that kind of problem uh, for elsewhere in Delaware. Right, that's exactly true. What the type of monitoring that is done is more about public health protection and not about the resource. Uh, the work that's being done to evaluate the quality of the resource. And when you do that type of work, you learn about what will probably happen in the future to the public health side of it. 
that has not been funded at any significant level for over 30 years. So definitely space for more for more information will be helpful. So we we have come up on uh, eight o'clock. We're a little bit past. Um, I think uh, just want to maybe ask one more question if I can. Um, sure. Somebody here is asking, uh, Bob is asking about the effect of failing septic systems in Sussex County on, uh, well, he's asking about on drinking water, but I'd be curious just in general, the effects, uh, septic systems, uh, a completely different sort of system than a public system, right? It's, it's one residence is responsible and it, often on well water. So the whole system is there for one residence and they fail, you know, at the, they, they don't last forever. They're expensive to maintain and replace. What sorts of impacts are we seeing in Southern Delaware uh, in Sussex County from septic? Um, so I'll take the first stab at this and I know Bill has something to say. Um, <laughs> that question repeats a real common misconception about septic systems. A failing septic system is not a, a, help, a threat to your drinking water because your drinking water is coming from substantial depth below ground. And what you're really having a threat to is exposure to pathogens. Right. If you have if you have sewage bubbling up out of the ground, it's loaded with viruses and bacteria. And there's an incident. Uh, Donovan Trailer Park has been in the newspaper recently uh, in Lewis for this problem. And then, yeah, that is a serious health problem. You don't want to come in contact with those things. Um, the more insidious part of septic systems is that a well functioning septic system pollutes the groundwater. And if you put too many of these things too close together, Everybody's drinking their own, uh, wa their own wastewater. And you're, the, the contaminant, the biggest concern there is nitrate because it, it is the one with a regulation and a standard and a known health impact. Uh, but that's the, that's the one that has historically been a bugaboo in the state of Delaware and has led to the creation of sewer districts and wastewater treatment plants, is, uh, especially in Sussex County. Thank you. In, uh, Dr. I think I think he's, it, Scott's given the, the the correct answer there. It's the the issue is that there's no systematic requirement that wells need to be tested once they've been permitted, and so it, it go, my experience at least locally in Southern Delaware is that people don't really know what the quality of their water is because they've never had it tested or or not tested in the recent decades. And in, in some cases, they don't really want to have it tested because they're worried that if it gets tested as if it's bad, that they're, they're going to have uh, financial consequences of that. So I think there, there needs to be more public supported um, of testing of domestic and small systems, which are the ones that ha often have this problem. And that's not the case in, for, uh, uh, in Delaware at present. Now, the, uh, the unfortunate thing here with that, there have been moves to incorporate uh, private well testing into the, the regulations that cover water wells for individual residences. And there are a variety of interests that make money on the transfer of real estate or the construction of water wells that don't want that to become a requirement. And so it's kind of strange. It's in Maryland, you have to. If you're going to transfer your property, you have to have your water tested. Uh, if you have a new house, you're not going to get your certificate of occupancy until you have your water tested. That doesn't happen in our state because it's bad for business, unfortunately. But um, things people can do on their own when they know, right? So like yeah. you said, education is the first first step towards making differences here. I want to uh, thank you both, Dr. Ullman and Dr. Landis, for uh, speaking with us tonight. Um, I know that I, I've definitely learned some things and uh, always do. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us um, for coming to this Ocean Currents lecture and remind you all that our final one is in two weeks, The Rising Tide, Are We Prepared? So will be a presentation on sea level rise. There were just hints of uh, you know, impacts on water tables and such tonight, so I'm sure we'll get more into some of those things. Um, I also want to direct people to the chat. We had someone uh, share a citizen scientist project, fieldscope.org. I don't know a thing about it, but uh, if somebody's making a recommendation, there might be a way to get involved there, so take a look. And uh, uh, as a, a final note, um, as I mentioned, two weeks from now is our final ocean currents, but 
Uh, we will again um, have Coast Day online this year with some lectures similar to Ocean Currents. So if you're interested in these sorts of things, keep an eye on decoastday.org for more information there. It will actually be a hybrid event this year over the weekend, um, but we will have some science lectures uh, that you might be interested in. So thank you all again for coming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ullman. Thank you, Dr. Andres, for joining us. Everybody have a good night. <laughs>